testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission. Good to see you guys who are here this morning. Um, Happy Memorial Day weekend. Hope that you guys are going to have some fun. Obviously, uh, we're able to do a little bit more this year than we were at this time last year. Uh, But it's good to see you guys here uh, this morning. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn over to Joshua chapter 5. That's actually where we're going to to start this morning before we work through um, Joshua 6. Um, If this is your first time with us and you weren't able to grab a scripture journal uh, at the welcome table on your way in, just raise your hand if you want one, and we would love to give one of those to you. It's just a free gift. Uh, We give those out as we study the Bible here together. Um, You can have the Word of God right there in front of you and take notes. So just keep your hand up. We would love to give that to you. I promise there's no bait and switch there that we steal all your contact information. We'll do that later. Um, But uh, that's just our free gift to you. We love the Word of God here. We believe it is how God speaks to us through His Word. And so we want you guys um, to have that. And so uh, we are in our fourth week of studying the book of Joshua together. And one of the things we've seen as we've been studying this book is, is we see that when God makes a promise, He keeps it. And this is a consistent theme that you'll see throughout all of Scripture. Uh, but one of the things I love about this book so much is because is, is you see this pattern consistently throughout the book of Joshua that God asks us as his people, the church, his bride, to follow um, as we follow after him. And it's that we see God make a promise, we see God follow through on that promise, and then with that we see God give um, commands or instructions to his people, and he asks us to be strong and courageous in following him and obeying his commands, not based upon our own performance, our own ability, who we are, what gifts we might have, but based upon his trustworthiness and his goodness. We see regularly uh, him saying to, to Joshua, be strong and courageous in obedience to me because I will go before you, because I am your God, because I have promised to give you the land. That God regularly, when he asks obedience of his people, he asks it in light of his character and in light of what he has already done or is going to do. And so last week uh, in Joshua 3, uh, we kind of saw God make make this promise to the people and kind of encourage them to respond to him in three separate ways. And so this week, most of our time is going to be spent in Joshua 6. And so we skipped chapter 4 and chapter 5. So I just want to give you a real quick rundown of what happens in those two chapters so we know where we are kind of in the narrative of what God is doing in the nation of Israel. So in chapter 4, um, after God has uh, stopped the flow of the Jordan River and Israel has crossed over uh, westward into uh, the promised land, we see that God commands Joshua to build a memorial in remembrance of the day that God had parted the River Jordan. Right? He says in chapter 4, the primary reason why they are going to uh, place that monument with 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel that God had given safe passage to as they uh, crossed the Jordan was so that in future generations, their children and their children's children might be able to walk past that place and say, hey, why are those stones there in that spot? And they would be able to look at them and say, this is the place that God did something miraculous, right? where he was faithful to us, that he was faithful to his promises, and in that we might remember his goodness to us and that we might trust him and follow after him. And so then moving into chapter five, right? And I, you guys may be wondering why I skipped that one. Um, Joshua circumcises all the men of Israel. Anybody wanna spend an entire morning talking about that? <laughs> Joshua circumcises all the men of Israel because what had been going on up until this point uh, is that for 40 years in the wilderness, uh, really that generation had kind of been disobedient to God and they hadn't followed the covenant that God had laid out for them. And so they cross the river, they enter the promised land, and, and this is a big deal. Joshua circumcises 
every male in Israel during that time as a sign of the covenant that God had made with Abraham and their obedience to trust him and follow after him. Right? We see consistently, right? God makes a promise, asks obedience of us, and Joshua leads the people to do what they are supposed to do previously, which is follow that sign of that covenant by circumcising their children. And this takes time to heal, so it's kind of crazy to think about, right? They cross the Jordan, they enter into the promised land, and it takes them about 30 to 60 days to heal up after all this. And I love this part. As they're healing, they named the place where they were at Gibeath Haraloth, which is the hill of foreskins, right? So you're like, oh, thanks for that information that I really didn't want, right? So they would remember forever, right, what God had done there. But this was actually really, really important to them to remember that because this was a turning point in Israel's history where the people were going to be obeying God again and trusting him again and following him according to what he had commanded of them. And after they did this, for the first time in the promised land, they celebrate the Passover together remembering what God had done for them in Egypt. And as they did that, for the first time since they've left Egypt, they eat from the promised land, that the food provided there is from the promised land, what God had promised to give them generations prior. And at the same time, right, God stops providing the manna from heaven. Right? We see this shift in the history of the nation where God is providing for them through his promise to Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant, as opposed to just providing for them as he's given them safe passage and delivery into the promised land. And so if you remember all the way back to week one, right, I said that we were going to see themes consistently throughout the book of Joshua, that we were going to see Joshua's growth in becoming a leader of Israel, and that Israel would respond to that leadership, but that ultimately the book of Joshua is about the glory of God being put on display for Israel to see and the world around them. Like my kids have these like Bible um, hymn songs, and any young parent knows that kids just love um, all these little fun songs to sing together in the car, right? And one of them this that, that I hear regularly anytime I'm in the car with the kids is Joshua won the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua won the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. And I'm like sitting there kind of grumpy. Thank, thank you. Um, I'll be trying out for the band in a couple of weeks when um, um, Josh gives me the opportunity so that he can flunk me out and not let me sing. But one of the things is I'm listening to that song and I'm like, I'm a pastor, and this is theologically incorrect. I don't like this, right? Because, it, because as we heard earlier when Kiara was reading that story, Joshua didn't do anything. Like, congratulations, you walked in a circle, right? Like, we get really excited when little kids do things like that. Oh, he walked, yes. Like, no one ever claps for me when I walk down the street now. It's like, we have a basic assumption of you, Kevin, that you should be able to do that, Right? No one's excited about that. And yet, right, we sing these songs and we teach them to kids and we read kids' Bibles and we do these things and we start making the people that God uses the heroes instead of God himself. Right? And what, we, what God is really trying to do as we read the book of Joshua is not have us be excited about Joshua, but be excited about him. Excited about his power, right? his presence, and his glory. Right? As, as we've seen throughout the book at this point, God has shown up multiple times for Joshua and the nation of Israel. Right? In chapter 1, he just shows up when Israel's at a low point, and he says to Joshua, I'm going to be with you. You're going to lead these people into the land that I promised them. Be strong and courageous. Right? And then in chapter 2, he performs a miracle where he saves a prostitute who's running a brothel inside Jericho. He saves her. He brings her to saving faith and knowledge in himself. And then she, in turn, saves God's spies so that they might go back to Israel. In chapter three, we saw God go before the Ark of the Covenant to lead the way and part the Jordan River so that Israel might cross it. And again and again and again, we see this theme. God promises, Israel responds, 
God's glory is put on display. And so when we get to the end of chapter 5, right, I may be reading into this, so you can throw this out if you want, right? Maybe, maybe this is like Kevin just placing himself in the scripture, which is always a dangerous thing to do, right? So hear me on that. But I'm like reading this, and I'm like, Joshua's probably starting to feel pretty good about himself, you know? It's like, here you had this disobedient, obstinate people who for 40 years couldn't do the most basic things that God asked them to do. And then Joshua rolls along. He's in the shadow of Moses, and he's singing to himself, look at what we've done so far. Right? We've, we've gotten the people to obey. We've crossed the Jordan. We've seen God's faithfulness, and I've got the people following the covenant. I'm a good leader. Like, this is good. I can be strong and courageous. Look at me. Right? If you think all the way back to Joshua 1, uh, verse 16 through 18, right? think about what the people said when, when Joshua was talking to them. It says, they answered Joshua, All that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. By the way, that is a lie from the pit of hell. He did not obey Moses all the time, right? But let's keep going. Thank you, Israel. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command them shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. And so by the time we get to chapter five, it's like, Joshua's like, all right, I can do whatever I want. And the people will listen. And everything I touch is going to go great. And we see victory after, after victory and people responding to Joshua's leadership. And God is going to come along at the end of chapter five. And then he's going to display throughout chapter six. He is going to remind Joshua what is really going on, that it's not about him, but it's about God and what he's done. And look at verse 13 of Joshua chapter 5 with me. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No. I love that. No. Let's keep reading. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So, right, Joshua, here he is. He sees this guy with a sword standing before him. He looks at the guy and he says, Hey, are you for us or for the enemies? And the commander of the Lord's army responds with what? No. I don't know about you guys. Doesn't seem to be an option that Joshua had laid out in that question. But if you read this closely, right, as as he continues talking to this guy with the sword, right, he reveals that he is the commander of the army of the Lord. And then as you read that, does does Joshua's response seem a little off to you? Like if this is just, right, some regular person who is a commander of the army of the Lord, even if it's an angel, right? Doesn't it seem a little odd that Joshua's response is to fall down and worship who he sees here? Like if you see it throughout scripture regularly, people encountering angels, right? A couple of things that you'll see in, 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 in the, the text is that the people will res- respond in awe But if they go to start worshiping the angel, the angel will stop them. Like, hey, no, no, don't do that. And yet, as you see Joshua fall before the face of the commander of the army of the Lord, right? He he worships him. And according to the text, this guy doesn't stop him. And then what happens is Joshua looks at him and says, well, what should I do? And the commander responds to him by saying, Hey, take off your sandals because you are in holy ground. Does this sound familiar to anything that happened previously in the history of Israel at this point? 
Yeah, Moses. As Moses approaches the burning bush, right, God tells him to remove his sandals because he's standing on holy ground, right? This is harking back to Exodus 3, where Moses met the presence of God in the burning bush. Theologians refer to this encounter that Joshua has here as a Christophany. And what that means is this is the pre-incarnate Jesus showing up on earth before he's born as a little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, right? That this is the pre-incarnate Christ. And here's why this, is, this little story is so important, that, that this is Jesus, the commander of the army of the Lord, showing up before, right, everything happens thousands of years later in human history, right? Jesus is showing up to remind Joshua, hey, this is all about me, man. Everything that you've seen, all of my faithfulness, everything you've seen up until this point is because of me, and I am going to continue to go before you. Don't buy into your own hype. It's all about Yahweh. It's all about the existing one. It's all about God. And church, this Same truth that Joshua is learning here is important for us as well, right? I I think sometimes we are so quick to believe in our own hype and our own giftedness and our own ability and our degrees and our job and our titles and our successes and our awards that, and and I I think this even goes for those of us who claim to have low self-esteem, because, because ultimately, really in reality, I think it's weird how this works out, but if, but if you have low self-esteem, what you're really communicating to yourself is, I should be able to do something, but I don't know if I can. But there's still an assumption of yourself that there's an assumption that you're going to be able to do something, and then you tested it, or you're second-guessing yourself, but there's an assumption that you're supposed to be able to do something, and you can't, right? And what... God is saying to Joshua as he meets him here before this this really, really pivotal moment in the history of Israel is, it's all about me. Joshua, you are no different from Moses. You're no different from Joseph. You're no different from Abraham. You're no different from Jacob. You're no different from Noah. I am the common thread in every one of those men's lives. Right? Remember that this is all about me. And so as we read through Joshua 6, right, one, one of the things we're going to see is as God is communicating this truth to Joshua, hey, don't lose sight of this, the, the fact that you are only successful because I have chosen you and because I am going before you and because I am keeping my promises. Right? He's going to communicate three things. He's going to communicate that God leads and instructs based upon his promises that Israel obeys. But when all of that works out, God is the one who gets the glory. God is the one that gets the fame and the renown. And we're going to see at the end when we move to the end here, we're going to see a similar pattern for us as the church in 2021 that we see and Joshua 6. Go over and look at just those first five verses of Joshua 6 with me. It says, Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus you, thus you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So notice here, right? God gives really detailed instructions on what they're supposed to be doing. 
right? Hey, march around the city once a day for six days. On the seventh day, march seven times, blow the trumpets, then shout, and the walls are going to fall. Now, sometimes there can be detailed instructions, but those detailed instructions seem a little off. Anybody else read this and think, I don't know. This doesn't seem to be a strategy for the siege of a well-fortified city. right? Why aren't we building siege weaponry? Why aren't we trying to parlay with the king? Um, are we just marching around the city in a show of force so that they'll eventually get scared and just starve them out so that they'll surrender to us? Like, what's going on here? And then your plan, just so I hear you right, God, is on the seventh day, we're going to make a lot of noise. That's the strategy. Be really loud. Kind of reminds me of that scene in Return of the King. You guys have seen that movie where Denethor, I mean, by the way, if you've seen that movie, could they have picked a better guy to look to be the mad leader of Gondor who was like just a complete loser? Right? But Denethor, right, here he is. He's protector of Gondor. He's not the true king. Um, no one respects his leadership, yet everyone's kind of submitting to him. Right? He finds out that his older son has died, the one that he loved, the one that was his military leader, and yet he has this son who's still a decent military commander, Faramir, around. And he's like, you know what? We have this well-fortified city with walls that have various layers that we could have these men stick around and defend the city with. Why don't you guys go to the edge of the river so you all die instead? That's, that's his strategy for defending Gondor is to send right, those guys out. And it's absolutely mad. I mean, if you remember Gandalf in the movie, he's losing it. It's like, this is a terrible decision. Please don't do this. Everyone's going to die. And then we won't have any of our warriors back here in the city to actually defend us. This is a terrible idea. And if you remember, it doesn't work out well. Right, Faramir gets mortally wounded, they get run over, and basically all they've done is successfully uh, not even slow down the oncoming army that's coming to take them over. The crazy thing is, is as I thought through right, that, that, that moment in that movie and what I'm reading here in Joshua 6, they both seem kind of like terrible military ideas. And yet for Israel, it's going to work. Like, that's how bizarre it is that it's going to work. And as we, as we see this, right, this is how God operates. He calls the people to a presumably absurd strategy. Why? That he could show off and display his grace to them. It's not as if God doesn't realize, hey, this isn't the natural way we would go about military conquest. It's not as if he doesn't know that. But if you think about this, what does Israel do in the course of Joshua chapter 6 that would earn them the military victory? Nothing. They don't do anything that would earn them victory over Jericho. And yet God, in his grace and his mercy towards them, is going to give them the victory in Jericho because of his goodness and his promise. Right? God displays nothing you do is going to deserve a perfect siege of Jericho, and yet I am going to give it to you. This is a, probably a good time to just take a second to pause and, 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 and just kind of reveal something to you guys. God's commands and wisdom are going to spit in the face of the wisdom of men oftentimes. I, I just, especially in a highly educated city like the one that our church is in, where we believe in higher education, we believe in the wisdom of man, we believe in philosophy. I, like, I, Guys, hear me on this. I have two degrees. I, I am thankful for my education. But one of the things, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ here this morning, that we just need to have a presumption of and understand 
is that the wisdom of God is going to spit in the conventional wisdom of man at times. This means things like sexual ethics, morality, etc. are going to spit in the face of worldly thinking, especially in a world that is increasingly focused on a survival of the fittest mentality. Let me, let me give you an example of just one thing in Scripture that I believe spits in the face of what the world would tell you, right? If you turn over to Acts chapter 20, Paul is speaking to the Ephesian elders right before he's leaving Ephesus. And as he's speaking to them, right, he's reminding them of how hard he worked in that city without asking for anything because he wanted to love them well. And when he gets to verse 35, look at what he says. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Friends, I don't care how virtuous you are or your non-believing friends around you may claim to be. The world does not believe that. They don't. And as a matter of fact, right, they would tell you to believe the opposite. Right? How many of you guys every year at New Year's, right, you're on social media and you've got friends on social media. And if, the, and if by the way, if what I'm about to mention is you, I love you, just maybe it's a rebuke from the Lord, I don't know. But you're heading into the new year and you you read their post and it's like, new year, I'm cutting toxic people out of my life this year. Done with them. No more toxicity. Now, first of all, no one keeps their resolutions, so good luck. By the way, you're toxic. So it's going to follow you. But you read that, right? And as I, as I was thinking that, I was like, man, but I see that in a lot of people. Like It's super, super common to see that amongst people now. It seems to spit in the conventional wisdom of what God says to be true. That instead of canceling people or cutting people out or shutting them down or throwing them out of our lives, right, or seeking to get whatever we can from people, right, whatever that may be. And by the way, I'm not saying that you might not have toxic people in your life. I would guarantee that you do because they're humans. but that to completely cut them out with no chance of of, uh, restoration or repentance, right, spits in the face of what God says to be true. Right, that no one is beyond the grace, mercy, and forgiveness of God. Right, that, that the world teaches us, right, Get your education, go to college, and then start moving up the ladder to amass as much wealth as you possibly can so that you can protect yourself and have all these things. And I would say you can do that, but if it's not connected to this principle that is more blessed to give than receive, you will lead a miserable life because it's devoid of the truth of Scripture. I can just say this, right? In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, when Paul himself is quoting Jesus, right? And I read that at face value, I don't particularly care for what Paul is saying there. What do you mean? What do you mean giving is more fun than receiving? Have you ever been at Christmas? Getting gifts is awesome. I love it. When my wife chooses to serve me and do the dishes and make dinner and let me just sit on the couch and not do anything, I happen to like it. One thing, especially if you ask any married couple that's been married for any particular amount of time, if they've experienced the beauty of serving one another and living that out, they'll they'll say this. Yeah, I enjoy serving my spouse. They get a lot of joy from that. Doesn't mean it's always easy. I get a lot of joy from that. And it's because you're living out the truth of what God claims to be true about the world around us that is more blessed to give than to receive. 
And so as we look at what's going on here in Joshua 6, and as we look at these absurd commands that God gives Joshua as the commander of Israel, it's intentional. It's intentional that God would, would tell them to operate in this way so that it might spit in the face of conventional wisdom, and that Israel would realize by the end of this story or this account, God was behind everything. And to him be the glory. And so when you get to verse 6, I'm not going to read verses 6 through 19 because there's just a bunch of um, uh, repeating of what's going to happen. Let me just tell you what happens in those verses. Israel obeys, right? They they get this really bizarre command from God on how to win the battle, and Israel complies with the commands of God through Joshua. And one thing I did find fascinating about all this, at least from the text, they don't complain. Like, they don't go to Joshua and be like, dude, are you sure? Are you sure you got the right words from God on this one? They might find that surprising. It's like one of the few times in Israel's history that they're not complaining or questioning God. Maybe, I mean, perhaps they had learned from their previous generation of parents, like, hey, don't question God, or you'll die eating a bunch of quail or never get to enter the promised land, things like that. Like, maybe we shouldn't question God. I don't know. He did just part the Jordan River for us. Maybe we should trust him on this one. I don't know. But I think what we see here from Israel is something that runs much deeper than just, hey, we learn from our parents and we don't want to follow that. They've been seeing time and time again, God is faithful. And therefore, they choose by faith to believe that God is going to come through on his promise of how he's going to deliver Jericho to them. They choose to believe God's word, even when what is being asked of them seems ludicrous to do so. They display the type of faith the author of Hebrews talks about in Hebrews chapter 11. Let me read that to you. He says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen, for by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. He says, faith is the assurance of things unseen. Things we hope for, the belief in unseen things, right? He's like, we don't see it, but we still trust. Israel stands before Jericho. God gives a seemingly absurd command to give the city, and they choose to trust him. Guys, this is, what, this is the pattern of what being a follower of Jesus is. That God makes promises and then asks us to follow in obedience, and we follow not because our obedience earns God's favor, but because God is trustworthy to follow and obey. He's worthy. He's faithful. He's faithful when you are unfaithful. He's worthy although you are unworthy. He's able when you are unable. Church, what might God be asking you to do by faith? What might he be trying to do in your life this morning? And he's not asking you to buckle down and become stronger and think of 10 spiritual disciplines that you could create and a pattern you could put in your life so that you could be the best possible you or the best Christian or have your best life now or whatever that may be. He's not, this is not right, a sermon on buckling down and being the best possible you. This is a sermon, right, that's pointing to the glory and goodness of God and saying that obedience follows God's faithfulness. When I think about this, right, I think about the story of this very church and its existence. And when I was in college and the Lord saved me, right, about a year into knowing the Lord, I met this beautiful green-eyed girl named Jackie. She loved Jesus a whole lot more than she loved me. And by like on the third or fourth date, um, I was like, I think I want to marry this girl, so I ain't going to fool around. So I'm just going to ask a bunch of questions and make sure we're on the same page. And one of those questions was like, 
hey, I want to have eight kids and plant a church somewhere. Are you down with that? And she's like, whoa, moving a little fast, huh? And after some prayer, she's going back. It's like, well, the kid thing, no. You better adjust. By God's grace, I did. Can you imagine me with eight kids? I got two, and they are winning. Um, but with the, with the pastor and church planner thing, she's like, yeah, I think, I think I'm okay with that. Like, I think we're cool with that. But at the time, our church was in the process of planning a bunch of other churches, and they were getting ready to plant a church in Tampa. And so Jackie just looks at me, and she's like, but not in Florida, honey. Florida sucks. She didn't say that, but she kind of did. And I was like, cool, I'll go anywhere. God, God, will, God will be down with it. It'll be cool. And so we thought we were going to go to North Carolina and plant in the Raleigh-Durham area. And so then through a process of prayer and fasting, God shut the door in North Carolina. And then I got a call out of the blue from this guy who lived in the Gainesville area who had heard about our, our churches and just kind of the work that God was doing through us. And he's like, hey, if I flew you and your team down here, would you come to Gainesville? And I'm like, dude, I don't know if my wife's going to go for that. Like I, like, I don't know. So I go to my wife, and I'm like, hey, this guy called me. I've been praying about it. Like, like we should go to Gainesville. We should visit there and see if, like, God might want us to go there. And she goes, that's in Florida. Like, thank you for the geography lesson. Yes, I'm well aware. Yeah, I told you we weren't going to go there. I'm like, okay, well, let's just go. If nothing, it's a free flight to the Sunshine State for a couple days, and we can visit our friends in Tampa who are planning a church. So we get down here, and I'm walking around. I'm like, there is no way. It's hot. We've got no family, no relationships. We, have, we know no one here. Right? This makes no sense. Why would we come here? This makes zero sense. So we're walking around, and we're meeting people, and as we're walking around that day, and we're, we're sharing the gospel with people, and we're asking about the churches that are that are here in the city and, and dreaming about what God might have for us. I just like, I felt the Lord. He's like, go, this is it. You're in the spot. I'm like, well, good luck, God, because my wife is not down with this. And we have another family that's also not cool with this idea. So we're walking around, and at the end of the day, I'm just like, all right, no one talk. Let's just go back, meet with your significant other. And then we'll see, we'll, 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 we'll grab breakfast tomorrow morning and, and we'll, we'll decompress. And so we get back to the place we were staying and I get with Jackie and we're in our room and I'm like, all right, sweetheart, what do you think? She's like, this is it. God wants us to come here. And I'm like, hello, what? <laughs> like, what? Okay, well, there's still so many things. She's like, I don't know, but God wants us to be here. Let's go. So we, so we start pivoting. Guys, the things that God has done with a group of immature, under-equipped 20-somethings over the course of the last eight or nine years in this city. All I can say to you is that you being here this morning is an example of God's faithfulness to his promise to build his church, not anything that we do. I mean, he's provided jobs for people when the economy was terrible, right? We saw... I think, like, per capita, more people trust in Jesus during the stay-at-home order than any other time in the history of our church. I'm like, how are people getting saved? No one can go outside. Like what, like, what is going on? Like, we came back and we had to have baptisms. I'm like, how are we doing this? Everyone's been stuck at home. Right? God has been faithful time and time again to us not because of our obedience or anything that we've done, but because God prom promised all the way back to Peter that he was going to build his church and upon the gospel, the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Right? This is what God does. And when we step out in obedience like Israel did, we don't receive some sort of special commendation. We don't achieve an extra level of Christianity or whatever crazy things we might you know, start believing about our own height. No, what we see is that obedience to God allows us to see him be faithful to his promises in the future. And as we do that, we experience an increased trust and faithfulness in our God. And we get to see, as 
I've gotten a front row seat over the last nine years of this church. God's glory go before us. Right, if you look at verse 20 of Joshua 6, right, look at what God does. It's, it's insane. They're marching around. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. So that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen and sheep and donkeys, with the edge of the sword. Happened just as God said it would. Jericho is destroyed. Rahab is saved, if you keep reading. And, I, and we could talk, I and mean, I could spend 15 minutes talking about the morality of them taking the city and killing everybody in there. I could. I could spend plenty of time talking about that. Let me just say this, right? Because I know there are some of you, we read this kind of stuff and we see, and we call it genocide or whatever term you want to call it. Let me just say this. In light of God, None are guiltless. I think one of the primary problems that we have as believers when we read the scripture and we see things like this happen in the Old Testament and we see people dying at the hand of war and saying what is just and what is unjust, just know this, there is no one just because God is holy and we are not. And so to ask the question of what is fair in these particular situations, it starts with the wrong premise because you're presupposing something that one, God doesn't presuppose, and two, isn't true. Right? You look back and, and you ask the question, you know, if you look back at Sodom and Gomorrah and be like, and, and Abraham's like, will you spare them if there's one righteous person? You know, he asks all these questions and God knows there's no one righteous in there. It's not one. By mercy, he saves Lot and Lot's family, except his wife, who couldn't follow simple instructions. There's no one that is worthy of God's mercy, and yet God gives it anyway. It's a miracle that Rahab gets saved and her family. It's a miracle because all of us if left to our own devices without the work of God and the Holy Spirit regenerating our hearts, will not choose to follow him. You won't. Promise I'm not going to go into to predestination of free will. Stop, Kevin. But just know this. If you are left to your own devices, you will not choose God's way. You will not. If you look in the Old Testament, right, it's like multiple times you read, and it's like God looks out over the world, and he sees there's no one good, not one. Can you imagine? Millions and billions of people, and God's like, no one. I've got no one to choose from. I'm going to have to do something on my own. But the bigger thing we see here, bigger than this idea of morality and, and what is fair and what is righteous and what is just and what is good, as we look at these types of things, is what does this account that we see in Joshua 6, teach us about God, it's this. God delights in using strange and obscure methods to do great things, to prove his power, and to display his glory. Scripture's riddled with them, right? Hey, Noah, build an ark in the middle of a desert to preserve the human race. Hey, Joseph, go down to Egypt so that I might preserve my people in Israel. Hey, Moses, I'm going to use you to deliver the people from slavery in Egypt. And by the way, I'm going to part the Red Sea on your way out. Church, our God delights in doing the impossible and making it possible. In using the wildest of circumstances and means so that he gets the glory because we exist for his glory, not our own. Ultimately, this is found in the cross of Christ. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 with me. That's where we're going to finish this morning. Right? Paul, as he's writing to the church in Corinth, is going to display this truth to them. 
Right? Corinth was a city that was wild. They, they, they were um, extremely, extremely licentious and all sorts of things. They lived as freely as they wanted. They considered themselves to be highly intelligent. They considered themselves to be really open-minded, uh, multicultural, all these things about themselves. And so Paul's planted this church there, and he's having to write this letter to them, and we're going to actually study this letter this fall, God willing. But basically what you see as you study the, the, Paul's letter to the Corinthians is you see this church has got all sorts of issues. I mean, every church has issues, but this church is like a special level of issues. And one of the first things he's going to say to them in chapter one is like, you guys don't even understand the basic principle of God's ways are not your ways. God's wisdom is not your wisdom, right? Look at verse 18 with me. For the word of the cross, that's the gospel, is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I mean, think, of, think about just what's being said right there in that sentence alone. The gospel's not just a message. It's not just a story. It's not just good news. It is power of God. Like the gospel is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discerning, discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Friends, God loves to make a mockery of the wisdom of man. It's one of his favorite pastimes. Oh, you guys think you're really something, don't you? Jews want signs. Greeks seek wisdom. God sends a baby. Born of a virgin of no account so that none might behold him. Son of a carpenter, exiled and returns. Comes from Nazareth, a place despised and rejected by his own people. God saw fit to make him the power and wisdom of God made known to us. The gospel makes a mockery of human wisdom and it's true. So what do we do with this? Right? Do we look at the wisdom of God? And what will we do with the gospel? What will we do with Jesus? Will we follow and obey him and believe and trust in him by faith? Like Israel did with Jericho? Or will, we, will we trust the ways of man? The wisdom of what man throws behind his church. Look at what Paul says next, because we may not be wise according to worldly standards, not of noble birth or power, but God chooses the foolish to shame the wise. Right? Look at what he says. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in who? The Lord. Some of you guys may be reading that and you're like, is God calling me foolish, weak, low, and despised? Yes. He is. 
That's exactly what you want to be in light of a holy, powerful, sovereign God. Not about you. It's not. Guys, it's not about our church. It really isn't. If this church fails next week, the gospel will go forth. If we all die tragically today, the gospel will go forth. And yet God wants to use you. He wants to use us. If we are in Christ, not so that we might boast in ourselves, our own ability, our own gifts, our own obedience, but that we might boast in the presence of God knowing that God is saying it's all about me and because it's all about me, I will use who I want to use. Church, we are in Christ. That's what scripture teaches us about who we are. And because we are in Christ, who is the wisdom of God, he gives us righteousness, redemption, and sanctification, and we can boast in him. Church, we have a great calling on us. We do. At the last words of Jesus, he gave a group of ragtag fishermen and a tax collector one of the biggest mission statements the world has ever seen. He looked at them and said, Go therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to deserve all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always until the end of the age. Now, if you were going to start a worldwide movement, you likely would not have chosen those 12 men. Just a hunch I have. You probably would have picked some educated, noble, wise, influential men and women to start your worldwide global movement of how God had rescued the universe. But God sees fit to call the foolish, the weak, the low, the despised of this world, not because of you, but because God delights in bringing himself glory and he wants to use you to do so. I've been doing something for almost two years here. That's one of the things I'm most proud of in you guys as I pray about you and I think about you and I pray for us as a church, right? The One Campaign, right? Where if you were a follower of Jesus, Right? We're asking you consistently to pray for one person, share with one person, and ask that God would save that person. That's it. We just want you to be the hands and feet of Jesus in one person's life. We've seen God save people's ones time and time again over the course of the last two years here. And here's the, here's the glorious thing. Some of you guys have someone that you wrote on that card and you laid it at the foot of our cross back here and you asked God to save that person. And as you were writing it, you may not even really believe that God could do it. You're like, my one is hard-hearted. God can tear down the walls of the heart just as he tore down the walls of Jericho. Like, you don't understand. My, my one loves their idols. They love to serve the things of this world. They're habitually caught, caught in it. God can rip down the idols that you serve and they serve so that they might know him. Church, God created us to serve him and to bring him glory. Might we listen to his instruction. Might we trust in his faithfulness and his promises that we might see his glory go forward before us and see people's eternities radically transformed by the grace of and power of God in Jesus Christ. Let's worship him and share with our one to see walls torn down, people saved, and God's glory. A testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission, which is to see the gospel in the likeness of his death and raise to walk in newness of life.